Hello, thank you for joining today's acquisition seminar hosted by the Federal Acquisition Institute. Today's seminar, entitled To Bid or Not to Bid, an Industry Perspective, presents a view of the federal procurement process from a different angle. Typically, we've brought you speakers from federal agencies. Now, we're going to hear from the other part of the procurement equation, industry. Why, you might ask. The federal government is in need of cutting-edge tools, products, and services to meet its responsibilities on behalf of the American taxpayer. It can only secure these tools, products, and services if it adequately engages with potential industry partners. This engagement should be in a constant state of cultivation. At the very least, it should occur through a formal solicitation with a clear and succinct statement of needs. What the federal government may be in need of most is an understanding of industry perspectives in procurements. One, what influences industry's decisions to bid on government requirements or get on government-wide schedules? Two, what challenges does industry face when evaluating government's requests for proposal? And three, what can government do to entice industry to participate in the government marketplace? Before we begin, let me remind you that we will hold a live question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. If you have a question about anything you hear from our presenters, we encourage you to submit it at any time using the survey link to the right of the video screen. We will collect and review your questions during the presentation, take a short break, and then return to answer as many as we can. So let's join Melissa Gary, Procurement Ombudsman from the U.S. General Services Administration, as we explore industry's view of federal government procurements with three distinguished industry professionals. Catherine Klaus, Senior Pro Program Manager, Hewlett Packard Enterprise Services, Antoine Ford, President and CEO, Enlightened Incorporated, and Stuart Gattelman, Vice President for Custom Training Solutions and Program Manager for OPM IDIQ Contracts, PDRI, a CEB company. Let's go to them now. I'm Melissa Gary, the GSA Procurement Ombudsman, and I am delighted to be the moderator for today's session. I'm joined by Antoine Ford, President and Co-Founder of Enlightened, Inc., a small hub zone minority-owned business, Stuart Gattelman, Vice President for PDRI, a mid-sized business, and Catherine Klaus, Program Manager with the Public Sector Enterprise Services Division of Hewlett Packard a large business. Our panelists represent a cross segment of industries and business sizes and I look forward to a lively and enlightened discussion as we walk through what it's like to walk in their shoes. I'd like to start by asking each panelist to give us a brief overview of who they are, what their role is, and how their company relates to the government marketplace. Antoine, I'd like to start with you. Thank you very much. My name is Antoine Ford, President and Co-Founder of Enlightened Incorporated. Uh, we are a small business, uh, HubZone certified, specializing in uh, cybersecurity as well as big data analytics and some uh, management consulting. Uh, we are a former protege of HP, uh, a new, uh, newly certified uh, DOD mentor as a small business. Um, the federal sector is an important business for Enlightened. Uh, we about 67% of our business is federal, about 33 state and local. Uh, we do hold several schedules as well as primes on several opportunities. Uh, so to bid or not to bid is a critical subject for us as a small business, and we're looking forward to this discussion. Very good. Thank you. Stuart. Thank you. My name is Stuart Gatelman. I am a vice president of PDRI, which is a CEB company. We are a mid-sized human capital consulting firm, with roughly 90% of our business being federal government, while 10% is commercial. Of our federal government work, about 65% of that work is civilian federal, and 35% is Department of Defense. We do have multiple contract types. We hold IDIQ contracts, we hold GSA schedules, as well as uh, BPAs, with roughly 80% of our work going through schedules and 20% of our work going direct from an agency uh, through direct contracting procurement. Thank you, Stuart. Catherine? Hi. I'm Kitty Klaus. I'm a senior program manager um, at HP Enterprise Services, a subsidiary of Hewlett Packard. Um, we repre while Hewlett Packard is very large in the commercial space, our uh, federal business size is about $4 billion. 
my GSA schedule programs account for about $200 million per year, making us for the past 15 years or so uh, consistently in the top 20 GSA schedule holders. Um, we do have a lot of experience not only with GSA schedules but other IDIQ contracts in the federal space and we have a robust program to handle task orders internally. So I spend a fair amount of my time reviewing those task orders and the RFPs coming forward. And um, I'm welcoming the opportunity to have the discussion today. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. So what we're going to do today is walk through um, the contractor perspective, the bid decision, communication pitfalls, and we're going to leave you with some key takeaways. So I know that you all represent different industries and your companies are different sizes, but what are some of the commonalities that you share in terms of internal processes and industry goals? Kitty? Well, let's start a little bit with those industry goals. When we sat down together, we found that we did have a lot in common in what we looked at. Um, what's important to us overall is the reputation of our companies. That's critical to all of us. Mm -hmm. Not only do we want to be the contractor of choice for our customers, but we would also want to be the employer of choice because it's important to be able to attract good people to get the business. It's also important among us to grow, to grow our business. We want to expand our business. We also want to expand our offerings. Uh, we're all constantly looking at what the market is doing and trying to keep up with that and increase our capabilities. And Antoine, you had a particular uh, area of growth that was a little bit different from a large business. Yeah, I mean, one of the important things that's different about a small business is the ability to show your government uh, partner that you have the capacity to do so. Uh, there's never a doubt if an HP can do a job. Uh, the government assumes that they can. But from a small business perspective, they're going to look at, can we attract the right people? Do we have the capacity and ability? Do we have the wherewithal and the financial capacity to do it? So from that perspective, that is unique from a small business perspective because we come to this situation with a little doubt at times from a federal government. They wonder uh, if, if we can do it. And so that's something that we have to keep in mind all the time. Okay. And so besides our reputation and growth of our business, it's important that we have solid balance sheets and positive cash flows with profit to keep our businesses going. Um, profit, I know some, to some people, can be an ugly word, but it's a business word. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's how we grow our business, that's how we grow our infrastructure, it's how our people are paid and we can attract top talent. Um, another important aspect to all of us here in the federal space is contributing to the mission outcome. Um, we're not in it just for the business and the profit. Uh, there is certainly a, a feeling among us that we're here to support the federal government, um, we're here to understand your mission, and to bring innovation to government can be very important to us as well. Stuart, if you have anything to add on that, or Antoine? I think you covered it well. Yeah, I think you covered it well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Kitty. That was great. Fantastic. So, guys, now that we've sort of broken the ice, let's, real, let's get into the real skinny of the, the session. When we talk about the bid decision and, and those kinds of things that go into that decision, um, one of the things that, that you all seem to have in common is the notion of qualify the deal. Mm -hmm. Kitty, what do you mean by that? Um, you know, when, when we issue a solicitation, it's obvious we're asking for the commercial sector to help us. So are you saying that you are making sure that you qualify to bid on the requirement? Or what exactly does that mean? Well, to qualify the deal, we'll get into this a little bit, um, we have to make sure it's the right fit. It's the right fit for our company, um, something that we could be successful at, um, and uh, overall it aligns with what we can do because we don't want to fail. That, that doesn't help those goals we talked about, reputation mm -hmm. and growth. Yes. So we want to make sure that we're in for good business. And for many large businesses, we work on very large opportunities, and that qualifying the deal can actually start well in advance of an RFP being released. Okay. So we have a sales force out there um, talking to their customers, trying to understand their mission, what needs to be done, where there's a need for innovation, and trying to find that right fit and where we marry up. 
we want to make sure we're ahead of the procurement. A lot of times if it if a big one hits us and we haven't heard about it, we're not prepared. Yeah. So it's probably not the right fit. So we want to be ahead of it. We want to make sure that we establish a relationship with the client or do we already have an established relationship. Uh, we look, especially on large deals, at the likelihood of procurement. We say, well, it's already out there. It's an mm -hmm. RFP. But in, in advance of it, we want to make sure are the stars aligned mm -hmm. politically, yes. mm -hmm. financially? Yes. Um, do they have an acquisition strategy? Feel you know if you guys see anything well, different on that. Well, it's interesting in terms of being ahead of the deal. That's even important as a small business. I know I've brought deals to HP, mm -hmm. and HP usually is saying, well, "Wait a minute, Antoine, we didn't hear about this deal. Mm -hmm. Why are you telling us so late?" And so, from a small business partnering with a large business. Uh, we know that's important. It actually right. changed our culture when we became a protege of HP because we started looking at deals significantly early. Mm -hmm. And even within our culture, we go through a bid, no bid process that talks about it. If it comes out and we haven't heard about it, mm -hmm. there's no way we're going to bid. Yeah, we we yeah. had this conversation about this. If it comes out and, and we're just finding out, we put our win percent chance or win probability at 10%. That's not where we're going to put our resources yeah. and allocate our capabilities and our financial uh, limitations. Mm -hmm. you know, we have to we have to bid on things that we have a good win probability for. Right. And really, we usually look at a 180-day window. We want to be 180 days ahead of that procurement yeah. release. I've, I've heard from companies that if you wait for it to appear in, in um, federal fed biz odds, mm -hmm. you're already late. Too right. late. Yeah. Absolutely. So. And I think that was, I heard an old acronym for the CBD, contract's been done. Yeah. <laughs> you saw it out there. Right, right. Yes. So. Okay. Well, right. other things we're looking at uh, early on before the deal comes out to make sure the agency's mission is aligned with our corporate capabilities. Uh -huh. uh, we want to make sure, uh, see if there's any integration with other programs. Maybe there's other programs we're doing for that agency or another agency that could be translated over. Um, we're looking for open communications with industry. That's a sign of a contracting shop or a program office yes. that wants to invite industry in to have discussions is always yes. a, very, a big positive. Yes. And uh, before we get to the hot topic of RFIs, anything else on that? No, I, would, I would just say that when someone says there's fair and open competition, saying it and having actions that back it up, you know, which are more meaningful, what you say or what you do, we usually find that what you do is more meaningful than what you say. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think it's it's very good that you're out there and you're engaging with government early on in the process, because that's that's one of the things that you know through the MythBusters um, campaign, we're focusing our efforts on engaging with industry early. So that's that's good to see that you guys are doing the same. And and speaking of engaging early, we're seeing more RFIs. Mm -hmm. um, now we noticed uh, using the GSA eBuy statistics that there's been a large uptick in RFIs and GSA, um, predominantly among the schedules, not as much among the GWACs. Um, and it seems to have coincided right about with the Small Business Jobs Act enacted that you could do set-asides on GSA schedules. Yes. Um, so we are seeing that uptick, but we'd like to communicate out there that uh, some understanding about what those RFIs mean from a business perspective. Uh, some of them, they do require bid and proposal funds, mm -hmm. which is a limited, we'll talk a little bit more in the resources section, but bid and proposal funds are limited at a company. And when we work on RFIs, it does take from that pot of money. Uh, we see some RFIs require an incredible depth of response, maybe a 70-page response. They want rough order of magnitude pricing on there. We have to get approvals for that. So we have to begin to evaluate responding to those RFIs because it takes away from opportunity money for other things. Uh, we have some discussion back and forth. Is the agency looking for free engineering advice? Yeah. Or is it a small business search? Are they looking to qualify two or more small businesses? As a large business, we have to think about mm -hmm. that response. Um, we want to know, is it a qualifying event? If we don't respond to the RFI, or we shut out from receiving an RFP? Yeah. So those things are Except helpful to know. Very good questions. So yeah, as a company that really values uh, and stresses or emphasizes our intellectual property, we look as, at an RFI as a place where we may not want to disclose a unique or novel approach that we take to solve a specific problem. So we might be less likely to respond to that RFI mm -hmm. for that reason, in addition to the reasons that Kitty mentioned. Wow. Yeah, I think one thing is pretty, 
it's critical. I know when I talk to small business officers and other procurement specialists, they're saying, Antoine, why isn't the small business community responding to RFIs? And I think two critical points, you're right, it's almost you're giving free consulting. Um, you are spending a lot of time and money on it. But the third one that's most important, a lot, uh, the response is not being provided back to industry. So you turn in an RFI and you don't often hear about what happened. And, and so if I had one piece of advice to industry or to the government side, it would be, let us know what happened. Did you not get enough response, responses from us? Um, was it not qualified? Because I think that would help the community be more effective with responding. So an, an RFI is ne not necessarily, from your perspective, too, um, a precursor to a requirement that's going to come out. We see a, we respond to a lot of RFIs we've never heard again Anything about. Anything from them. They just okay. disappear. Maybe it was a, a truly a market research effort mm -hmm. and it just didn't receive the funding. Um, maybe it went to a small business and we can't see that because right. that's posted on a separate site. So a lot of times we just don't know what happened the end of it. A recommendation that I've seen used on for market research is social media. GSA has their Interact website. We've seen the Alliant GWAC yes. group and the Oasis uh, yes. Mac use mm -hmm. that very efficiently yes. to get information, input from contractors about how what things to look for in the RFP, uh, certifications that could be in there, um, scope, so lots of different questions out there. I think the Alliant team recently put out a question on the cybersecurity requirements and they've received a lot of input from industry. It's a lot easier for us to use those type of blogs. Yes. So that's another way, uh, instead of a formal RFI, mm -hmm. that uh, contracting offices might use. The other thing we'd like to say is when an RFI goes out, it's different from an RFP, communication should not shut down mm -hmm. when the RFI goes out. But we are finding contracting activities that give it the same gravitas mm -hmm. and say, I've put out an RFI, now I'm not going to speak to you. So that shouldn't be the point where the door is shut. Yeah. Right. The RFI does I, not I begin agree. with procurement trays. Right. So it is still market research. Mm -hmm. um, there are GSA sometimes will, if you write a white paper, will invite you in for one-on-one -on -one discussions. Mm -hmm. We encourage that. That's a good opportunity to exchange ideas. So there's other things you can do. Yeah. Um, I, industry yes. days would be the other. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, if you have an industry day, please don't read the RFP to us. Um, make it a... That's not helpful. It's not helpful. <laughs> right. It's not helpful. It does happen. Mm -hmm. um, but also understand that... Um, on industry days that we may not ask the questions you're really looking for because we don't want to tip off that competitor. Yes, yeah, as a, as a contracting officer I certainly remember that. Mm -hmm. So, and, and Stuart kind of mentioned it um, a few minutes ago when you were talking about the RFI, you know, you're reluctant about giving away proprietary information. So, yeah, we've, yeah. we've done it, we've had it come back to us and the RFP is a requirement. And it's, you know, we know we have not, well, we know it may not be targeted directly for us, but they've incorporated some of the information we've provided. And so we're reluctant to do it, you know, once bitten, twice shy. Yes. I understand. Well, let's look at some other qualifying the deal. Mm -hmm. uh, this is after the RFP shows up. <laughs> and uh, we have some red flags that might be in the RFP. Uh, I said, uh, when RFPs come in on our GSA programs, I read them. I look at it with more of a contracting eye and say, what's in this RFP that we need to ask questions about? And uh, there's some things that come up that might be problem areas early on. So I wanted to take you through some of the red flags. Okay. Uh, no RFI draft or industry day. So if just plump there, it's out. That could be a red flag that okay. you didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody else knows about it, so maybe it's not for you. Um, early on on eBuy, when they would send out the notifications, the kind of rule on the street was if you didn't get that email that said, hey, it's out there, you weren't supposed to bid on it. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, I, we see that all the time. If we, get, if we see something on eBuy and we didn't get the email, we, we, we believe it's not for us. We shouldn't even bid. But then I've spoken to contracting officers who go, I didn't know I was supposed to send an yeah. email. I thought oh, it went to everybody. Yeah. And they'll say, Antoine, why didn't you bid? 
yeah. we, we got that at the end of the fiscal year. So we didn't know about it. So my advice would be if you're in doubt, ask. Mm -hmm. You know, call the contracting officer and ask. Did you send me a special? No. no. <laughs> no. They're not answering the phone by then. Not well. <laughs> uh, another uh, red flag would be an unrealistically short time to respond. Yes. Um, I think what was common with all our companies if, is we have processes to get approvals. Um, to get the money to bid, to work on it, and five-day turnaround times, uh, that seven-day, that screams. You're mm -hmm. searching for someone who's waiting to catch that. Yeah. Yeah. I certainly can see how that, that message would be perceived. Yet, when I've spoken to contracting officers who've put out a short-term one, they said, but you have a GSA schedule. It has rates. Just just write down the, the, the labor categories and the rates. That's all you need to do. It's already approved in your schedule. Right. It's an RFQ. An RFQ still requires a technical approach. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, we still have to get approvals even to write down those rates, even yeah. though they're approved in our schedule. I mean, they're quality checks that we have to go through. If you follow all of our processes, you're going through, you know, your red teams, your blue teams, your gold teams. Mm -hmm. um, you want to make sure that we turn in a proposal to our partners, the government, that they would be proud of that is compliant right. with what they want. Right. It's very difficult to go through that level of quality in a three to five day turnaround unless you're doing a cut and paste job. Mm -hmm. And that's something we just don't want to do. Right. Or right. unless you knew about it ahead of time. Unless you knew about it ahead of time. Mm -hmm. and you already have it. And, and you had the extra time. Yeah. Uh, another is unrealistically short transition time frames. So it might say, well, after award, we need the server consolidation up and running within one week. Uh, well, wait, no, wait a minute. That's, Good luck. Yeah, that's, that's not going to work. So again, that might be an indication that it's wired to the incumbent. So, uh, next one would be evaluation criteria being rather vague, um, how they plan to award the contract. You don't want to see that. And uh, price evaluations not clearly defined, uh, especially on IDIQ contracts where you, or a BPA where you're going to list all your labor categories you'd like on that BPA. Well, how are they going to evaluate the pricing? Uh, worst case scenario, they add up all the labor category rates and divide by the number of categories. That's kind of frightening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's not a good evaluation. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. It needs to be clear. It needs to be laid out. Yeah. So we have a few more red flags. Um, high number of past performance requirements. Uh, so, you know, that's... Con contracting activities like past performance uh, references, but we're finding on the um, program management side or customer side, they're getting fatigued and they don't want to fill it out. So you may have a stellar customer, but when you've used them on 20 different RFPs, mm -hmm. they put up a sign saying, don't call me. Right. Don't send me a past performance request un unless it's over $2 billion, the work. Or they put some restrictions in it, and they have fatigue. Not only is my company asking them for references, mm -hmm. but Antoine's company mm -hmm. and another vendor are all asking them for references. So there's definite fatigue on the side of our customers. Now, are you saying, Kitty, that you have to get a reference for each requirement that you bid on? I mean, can you use references from a previous requirement or a previous bid? Uh, right. They want us to go back to your customers. Yeah. Say you did a, um, a training implementation. They'd like to go back to your past customers and say, mm -hmm. give me a reference. But yeah, and, right. and more specifically, Melissa, they are saying, you know, even under an IDIQ, for task order one, you've got to go back and get past performance references. Oh, here's a new project underneath the same IDIQ. Go back to your customers, get new oh past performance goodness. references. It's gotten wow. to the point where one of our client agencies, a large federal law enforcement agency, is not allowed to do past performance references anymore. It's been taking up too much of their time. Wow. Yeah, the interesting thing is you almost have, Kitty, I love your perspective, is I got a bank of a number of past performance references I could use. And at the end of the day, I, I have to say, I don't, it, 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 it's consistent with if I believe I'm going to win mm -hmm. or I have a good shot of winning, then I'll say, let's use this particular person because that person, my customer, is only going to have uh, a few that they're going to say, I'm going to get kind of tired. Are you winning yet or not? Okay, because they're asking every time for them. Right. And so we have to be careful with that. Okay. 
Um, a red flag test is a high number of detailed qualifications for key personnel, or a large number of key personnel. Not everyone is key, um, but when you have you know, all these requirements, it begins to look like somebody's job description. Maybe somebody that already has the job. And uh, so that's a red flag. And technical requirements that are very narrowly defined and seem to really specify a very certain brand or product or service. So they would be red flags to us that this probably isn't a good deal for us. Yeah, we did have a, a story of it. I won't name the agency, but we had an agency that had a requirement for almost all the key personnel to have a PMP, mm -hmm. with the exception of the overall program manager. And we couldn't understand why that was the case. So we started doing digging because this just didn't make sense. And we eventually found out that the incumbent had a program manager that couldn't pass the PMP. Okay. <laughs> Red flag. Red flag. <laughs> and so we ended up, what we did, literally, we actually wrote a note to that particular organization because we had a relationship with them. And we said, let's be honest, this is going to be protested. So you should either change the requirement um, or delay it. And they ended up delaying it because they realized that it was so wired for the incumbent that they appreciated the fact that we understand you like the requirement, the uh, incumbent. We understand they're embedded, but don't do this because you're asking for a protest. Right. Exactly. So what, what was accomplished within the period in which it was delayed? Did the person pass the... PMP no, they just stay with the incumbent. Oh, okay. And, and, okay. But we knew that's what they wanted, and yeah. it was okay, uh, because I'd rather know that mm -hmm. than spend my bid and proposal dollars that the incumbent's doing well, they're right. doing a good job, right. that's fine. If I'm the incumbent, yeah. I want to stay, so I understood that's yeah. what they wanted, but I wanted an honest process. Right. I, yeah. I agree. And, and in terms of the advantage that the incumbent has, there's virtually no way you can erase that. They will always have that advantage. Well, we could talk about that advantage because there's something called incumbentitis. <laughs> and incumbentitis means you know too much and you're there with your customer every day and it's actually becoming more of an issue, especially in areas of LPTA, mm -hmm. when that's used as an evaluation criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a framework of what your customer would like, no, and uh, but then when the procurement comes out, it's skinny down, and you might be bidding to something, some higher level. Right. And we did have um, an instance of that a number of years ago. We had a, a satellite contract, and we knew that the customer, uh, the satellites needed to be repointed. Uh, but the repointing of the satellites was not in the RFP. Mm -hmm. Yet we included the pricing to repoint the satellites, which we knew needed to occur. Mm -hmm. And uh, someone else won that deal because they did not price in the repointing of satellites. You know, about a month later after that award, they had to repoint the satellites. Oh, my goodness. How about that? <laughs> yeah, it's wow. the incumbentitis, our definition is writing to what you writing to what you know the client needs, not what they ask for in the exactly. RFP. Exactly, right. mm -hmm. exactly. And we beat our folks over the head with that. Write to what's in the RFP. Exactly. You, you have to, I understand what you're saying, Kitty, and... But you, you have to balance the two. And maybe you do know that down the road this will have to be done, but it's not in the RFQ. Correct. So, yeah. So you know, Antoine used the term partner earlier. Yes. And we view ourselves as a partner with government uh -huh. as well. Uh -huh. One of the things that we value in a partnership is when the government communicates clearly with us, too. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk a little bit more about communication. But a good example of that is when there's a multiple award IDIQ, if a new task comes out for release under that IDIQ or a call under a BPA, multiple award mm -hmm. BPA, and there's somebody currently in place performing the work, tell us that. Right. Just give us that information. That way we can make a more informed decision. And we can bid on something that maybe we think has a higher win probability and allocate those BMP funds more appropriately. So we love two-way streets. We yeah. love partnerships. I, I, I agree with you. And I think for most of us in this, this world of acquisition, what we are constantly told and what's reinforced is the issue of fairness. I mean, don't do anything that's going to tip the scales one way or the other. So it's, it's hard to avoid that. And that leads us into the next part of qualifying the deal. Mm -hmm. um, these are some of the, the issues we run through as we're looking at the RFP. These aren't red flags, but uh, as we're reviewing the RFP, things that we see. Well, before you go into that, Kitty, when, on the issue of the red flags, are the red flags ever used in a positive way? I'd, say, I'd put positive on a little shaky ground. There okay. are 
Um, certainly some of those can be used to give, um, if a contracting activity really wanted a particular vendor, mm -hmm. they could use some of those red flags, such okay. as a short time frame, okay. um, the requirements, and, and turn them around to, uh, Antoine, I think it's almost like to warn us off mm -hmm. that, it, that, it, that it is really intended for someone else. Okay. So kind of key qualifiers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, there are some exceptions. Into the fiscal year, mm -hmm. from the small business perspective, uh, when we were 8A, we knew that literally you had to turn proposals around in two weeks. Yes. A week and a half. Literally, we, we have done a proposal. We graduated from the 8A program in 09, but we did a proposal overnight because those dollars had to, 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 to be, they had to spend the, yes, the money. And so exactly. we're aware of that factor. I think small businesses are aware of that. Mm -hmm. That towards the end of the fiscal year, particularly for the 8A program, mm -hmm. they're going to have to spend those dollars. Okay. So they're aware of that exception. Okay. Okay. Um, and if you really do want an incumbent, someone there, I mean, it's like she said, they're doing a good job. Doing a good job. We don't want to take our resources there if there's no chance. It's not a bad thing. Well, you know, in our personal lives, that's probably exactly what we would do. But the fact that we're working with tax dollars... Right. And it, it, again, and it, it may not even be cognizant. That. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. just gotchas. Mm -hmm. um, some things we do to qualify the deal is, you know, we go and we read the RFP. What's going on there? Um, templates and recycled RFPs. Time is short. Um, contracting activities are understaffed at times. Mm -hmm. And use templates. That's good. Um, just asking that you make sure, a couple things. One, erase the old information. There's, you know, nothing Definitely. will warn us off faster than saying the location of the work is at 100 South Main Street. Hey, isn't that where our competitor's located? <laughs> okay. Take that out of the yes. template there. Um, uh, or the recycled RFP. Also, make sure that the template you're using aligns with the type of contract. Because if you're doing a GSA schedule procurement and you're using a template that refers to cost and pricing data, mm -hmm. you're going to get some questions. Yes. And that leads us into the next part, the Q&A, which I find some of the most entertaining part of the whole RFP process. Um, you know, uh, it's interesting when you get back the questions, how many are there? And what's the quality of responses? So not too long ago, there was an opportunity. And on the first bounce, 436 questions were submitted. Yeah. Um, and so you might think you have an issue with your RFP and uh, contemplate yes. pulling it back yes. because on the second bounce, they got about 135 more. And still the RFP was not pulled back. And it's now since been awarded and no surprise it's under protest. Okay. I don't know the details of the protest, but I'm going to imagine over 500 questions there might produce some fodder. Yeah, I, I, I would think that the early warning signs were there. Right. And, and the quality of the, the, you could tell the fatigue on the contracting activity as far as the answering. Um, they kept referring, well, see question 13, yes. see question 13. Yeah. Um, or it, towards the end, they got questions, what operating system are you on? And they wrote, don't understand your question. Uh, you know, you could tell they were tired. Okay. Um, on the q and I view it, uh, I once had a professor that told me the final exam is the last chance to get educated on that subject. Mm -hmm. And I view q and A somewhat the same way. It's an opportunity to educate. Mm -hmm. And so understand when we ask some of these questions, we're trying to send you a message. Yeah. Something is okay. wrong mm -hmm. and we're trying to tell you that. Yeah. And yeah. we may not be able to blatantly come out and say it. Mm -hmm. um, I, at working at another company, I had a question on, it was a big data center implementation and required literally staffing up a data center. And yet, being GSA, it said no open market over $3,000. Well, when you staff a data center, you have T1 lines, you have infrastructure, you have the facilities. And we asked a question on that, given you couldn't have the open market and those type of things don't normally occur on a GSA schedule. And, the contracting officer responded that space was included in our GSA rates. Wow. wow. But okay. I will tell yeah. to okay. that contracting officer, if you're out there, the space <laughs> is a cubicle or an office maybe, but not a data center. <laughs> so you're, you're trying to communicate yeah. something is off. Exactly, exactly. And it's, it's, it's not being received. 
Wow. Uh, the other thing on there is leave ample time so we can review the RFP and develop the mm -hmm. questions. Um, I realize timelines can be short, but we sometimes get RFPs, say they come in on a Monday and they want questions by Wednesday and say no further questions will be accepted. That really sometimes isn't enough time yeah. to be able to review that. And on the flip side, uh, respond to our questions well in advance of the RFP being due. Um, too often they get answered two days before mm. and oh. it may cause a change in the solution, right. which is a change in the price. Mm -hmm. And then the approvals have to go through. Uh, we've had it happen as well. You know, questions are answered on Thursday, proposals still due Monday. Right. It's four working days away, right? Right, right. So we need to get better with our time and we need to be more succinct and accurate in our responses to you. We understand that contracting activities often need to go back to the program offices to get the answers, and there's a lot of communication going on in the government side. We understand that. It's but, even more than that. We want that. We want the contracting yes. officer to go to the program office yeah. and get the, the correct answer that will help us provide the best solution to the government. Exactly. Exactly. They can't do that in isolation. They, they have to go back to the program or the requirements office because it's, it's their program. They know it. So. It's I. We know contracting activities want to meet their deadlines, but please add on extra days to the yeah. procurement. It, it will make for a better RFP. Yeah, and I think it, in in some instances it'll save you. On if you take a little bit more time on the front end, it'll save you on the back end. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, or having to deal with a protest or whatever, or Absolutely. almost five hundred questions. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, along with qualifying the deal. Um, some other things we look at, uh, terms and conditions appropriate to the contract. Mm -hmm. um, you know, are we looking at FAR 8.4 for the schedules? Mm -hmm. Are we looking at FAR 13 for the simplified acquisition? Mm -hmm. Are we looking at 15 for the negotiation? Um, you know, in the GSA schedules world, you can add additional clauses as long as they don't conflict. Right. And we see that from agencies, and that's generally fine. Mm -hmm. But just have an overall understanding of what belongs in there. We had an RFP once that came in and said it was under both FAR 8.4 and FAR Part 16, the IDIQs. Well, they're a little different. Mm -hmm. It asked for Buy America product, but the GSA schedules bring in Trade Agreements Act. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't guarantee that the products being sold were Buy American, but I could guarantee they were Trade Agreements Act certified. So just understanding where you are in the FAR will take out a bunch of those questions. Okay. Um, another hot button we've discussed is uh, aligning requirements aligning with your contract type. And a lot of times this happens in the fixed price arena. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I start off reading so many RFPs that say this is a performance based firm fixed price task order. And when I get in further into it, I find that on invoicing, we will be reporting all our labor hours, oh. the hours and the rate, turning it more into a level of effort or a time and materials. I think you've seen this. We've seen it many times. And there comes a point where I kind of feel the contracting office has to educate their client. Because I, I realize the client or the program office is, is sometimes asking for this. So we want to see the burn rate. We want to see which labor category is charging what number of hours? Mm -hmm. Well, that's not what's key here on fixed price, especially performance-based fixed price. We're not looking at the method to get to the end result. You should be focused on the end result. And does the end result meet the evaluation criteria that were established? Okay. If it does, box checked, uh, you know, deliverable accepted, mm -hmm. payment paid. I just, from a personal basis, wondered. You know, we, ten years ago, a lot of our business was time and materials, and contracting activities had. I want to say a lot of control, discretion, mm -hmm. because they saw our labor rates and our categories, and you know they would approve sometimes on a line item basis. But when we move to firm fixed price, that's not necessary anymore. And I wonder, is it more, I'm going to say a habit, uh, but a control that the contracting officers want to know what's going on. Um, there has to be, I think, some element of trust in allowing the contractors to manage their business right. to get to that price. I mean, I think going back to a previous point on fixed price contracts, uh, your requirements in the contract have to be very structured mm -hmm. because if we're looking at a fixed price contract, 
with a high risk of undefined requirements, that risk is then passed on to us as industry. Yes. And so we're very careful if it's a fixed price contract that those requirements are very structured and very measurable and achievable mm -hmm. such that if we go for that deliverable, we're going to be consistent in making sure that we do address, as, the, as we say, meet the mail. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they are ambiguous requirements, we're very leery of that for a fixed price contract. The risk is just too high. Yeah. Right. I, I get that. And the last point on this uh, page here, understanding the contract vehicle. So especially in GSA, you have GSA Alliant, mm -hmm. 8 STARS, you also have GSA Schedules. Mm -hmm. And Alliant STARS are not schedules. Right. And they operate a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure if it's a training issue or just familiarity with the vehicle. Mm -hmm. But understanding that um, on GWAX, you don't normally ask for a discount off uh, the price. Right. It's, it's a little bit different from the schedule. Right. Um, or in Alliant, uh, those rates are meant for TNM. And on Oasis, the rates that are in the contract are meant for time and materials in a non-competitive arena. And that mm -hmm. they're allowing competition to determine the actual rates uh, when it comes to fixed price. So just being aware of the nuances between the different vehicles. I, I agree. So that the, the basis of award is different mm -hmm. for both vehicles. Um, we have just a few more here. Qualifying the deal just goes on and on, but it is important. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's very meaty. Um, pricing requirements. Uh, we, as we mentioned before, we'd like to see them in the evaluation criteria, make sure you know we're not just adding and dividing rates to get to an average. Um, Look at your spreadsheets and formulas, make sure they work, and understand that when there's complex pricing tables, that may put off new bidders, um, and it certainly increases the cost. Uh, when you have page limitations, I talked to a capture manager, these were interesting. They look at their page limitations to get a sense of how much the proposal is going to cost, how much writing is going to be needed on there. So, and page limitations um, can have an effect on competition. If you have an unlimited, that could favor incumbents. So, take a look at that. It is nice to kind of box it in there for us. And finally, we have oral presentations. A number of agencies are moving there. Mm -hmm. um, make sure you have a clearly defined process on that. And. Uh, we think it's a good idea that you actually request to meet with the actual delivery or technical team presenting it. Yes. It's very easy to bring in those performers for your company, um, but I think it's more meaningful to talk to the tech team. And, uh, just recognize, too, that oral presentations do add to your proposal costs. Anything on those? I went through those a little bit quickly. No, that's good. Well, I, I have a question on the, the, the point that you just made that they add to your um, proposal cost. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Is it like the travel to get to the location? Is it um, the media I, tool? or the, It can be the whole show. We, we personally bring in, and I don't think we're alone on this, there's a whole industry of proposal coaching. Yes. Oh. Coaches that come in okay. and help you put together your presentation assist on your speaking skills. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're talking the travel costs and the time away from a job for proposing teams, okay. the personnel mm -hmm. being there, the preparation of the presentation, the content, the preparation of the delivery of the presentation, whether it be a coach or without a coach. It's, mm -hmm. you're talking days and days of time now in preparation okay. to make sure we get it right. Okay. And I'll tell you, there's, there's nothing more frustrating than getting in the room and talking to the folks a little bit ahead of time and realizing that they don't have objective criteria for evaluating your presentation. That's that's got to be in place. Okay. And it's not who you know. It's how well, how well the content in your presentation meets the requirements. Yes. Not even how well it's presented. Because I'll tell you, a lot of my technical folks who are the best folks on the job are not the best presenters. Yep. Right. And I tell them it's okay to hesitate. It's okay to pause and think about your response. It's okay to be nervous. That shows you care about what you're doing. But that that has to be there with the evaluators. They have to realize it's not the polish. It's the substance. I think that's important, particularly. If you got somebody who's, that's their science, their technology, they may not be the orator. Right. Right. right? right. And so we have to be very careful from that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, 
this cottage industry of oral coaches, I mean, they, we're talking body language. We're, they would not like me using my hands right now. <laughs> um, but literally looking at body language, where you sit in the room, mm -hmm. for individuals who are the greatest people in the world about delivery, you're putting them in a situation where they're like, oh my God, what is all this stress? Yeah. And so yeah. understanding that you know, we, we want to present well, but understanding mm -hmm. that the people, we, we're bringing the real people that are doing the work there mm -hmm. and understanding that that's what they do. But overall, I think we like oral presentations. Mm -hmm. We like yeah, that we ability, too. especially if there's some dialogue, mm -hmm. yeah. the Q&A, yeah. some interaction with that. Um, but a lot of times the, your oral presentation is being composed at the same time you're finishing up your physical proposals. So you have a lot of overtime going on as mm -hmm. far as resources. Yeah, I see. And we just need to be clear about how we're going to evaluate the proposals. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Yep. And the timing, when will that occur? Yeah. Because we need to make sure um, all our resources are geographically in the same area at the same time. And that can take some coordination. And I will say, for larger bids, I do like a two-stage process. Mm -hmm. Take the written proposals, do a down select, uh -huh. bring, okay. in the, bring in the folks who have the best written response to do the orals. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. And FedSim has been working with video orals lately. We're kind of watching to see how that happens. I worked with a team that went through that already. They enjoyed it. So that was a positive. We kind of look forward to it. That's Wonderful. Awesome. Wonderful. All right. I think that covers qualifying the deal. Okay. And so now. so now we've, we've qualified the deal. Um, so next, we look to resources. Um, Stuart, I'm going to ask you if you could speak more about what resources you're referring to. Does this include the folks who actually write the proposals or what's the universe? When, when we say resources, we talk about the people, the time, the cost, mm -hmm. the effort. It really is a full bundle or full bag of resources required. But we have a limited amount of funds. So at times we can fund our proposals. At times we actually lean on our personnel to do that over time that Kitty referred to. Mm -hmm. Especially if it's something that you might be personally interested in and have an investment or a vested stake in. Mm -hmm. We will lean on our folks to do uncompensated overtime. Um, the bottom line for us is to be smart and make those smart decisions on that qualified bid, as Kitty talked about it. But let me talk about a little bit of or a few factors that might impact our ability. Um, first of all, let's, let's look at schedule. Just because we get an RFP, it doesn't mean, as Kitty pointed out, we're not going to automatically respond to it. We have to look at our internal factors. What else are we working on at this point in time? Where's my, my proposal staff? I should be so lucky to have a large proposal staff. But where's my proposal staff? What are they working on now? And we have a few key folks who we lean on to do our quality assurance, to do our editing, to do our formatting. If those folks are engaged in a couple of other large efforts, it's going to make it much more difficult for me to do that effort, to respond to that effort. And even more than that, or equally as, uh, as important as that, is where's my technical staff that has to write the response? If my technical staff is working full time, say at a client site, and then I'm going to pull them off of that to work on a proposal, I'm getting hit twice. I'm getting hit with a B&P cost, mm -hmm. and if it's a level of effort contract, I'm losing that revenue. Yes. That's a very costly investment for me to make. Um, Kitty talked about time. How much time do we have to develop the proposal? We'll certainly look at that as part of our resource and budget accordingly. Now, when I say budget, we do run a proposal like it's a project. We'll put it in a Microsoft project. We'll set out our timeline. Mm -hmm. We'll put the formal deliverables in place, and that's what's got to be met. Otherwise. They end up getting done at the last minute, and then it's 72-hour days. Mm -hmm. um, when's it due? And this is my favorite case. You know, <laughs> every year right around Thanksgiving, we start looking <laughs> for proposals to drop. Yes. Because we know federal employees have use or lose. Yeah. By the way, we do too. <laughs> um, and we see that proposal coming, or we get wind of the proposal coming, mm -hmm. and it's going to come, oh, December 15th, due oh, wow. January 2nd. Wow. Um, we've had it more than one time, and that's, you know, we love you guys, we want to respond to it, we think it's an important proposal, but sometimes it's hard to get staff off of their you know, European vacations or wherever they're heading this year for the holidays right. to come in and focus on the proposal. Well, we know there's a rush right at the end of the fiscal year, mm -hmm. but I, I, just, I, I just didn't think about the holidays, too. We, we do, I mean, and this is, I mean, I've been doing this since 1995. It's almost every year without fail. Okay. We've had to pull staff, usually it's either Thanksgiving and or the Christmas holiday. 
And you know, as I've gotten older and I have a family, I realize that that Christmas holiday is less flexible because that's when my kids are out of school too. Yeah. So it's yeah. and we want to respond. We really do. Just a mutual consideration of your partner would be appreciated. <laughs> it's helpful. Um, let's also look at the solution required. For a solution, is this a solution that we have to be innovative and creative and come up with a solution? Or is this RFP we're responding to essentially a staff augmentation solution? Well, certainly staff augmentation is an easier proposal to write. Uh, we can write that proposal fairly quickly if that's a line of business for a particular client that we're interested in. If it is not, it takes a lot more effort, uh, a lot more resources. Now what do you uh, mean by staff augmentation? There, there are contracts, uh, whether it's a CETA type of contract or a customer support contract, mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't necessarily, people sometimes hear CETA and they think low level. CETA is not necessarily low level. Um, it's actually engineering technical support. Um, but we have a customer, our folks, our PhD level folks sit on site to augment their workforce. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Um, and then, you know, the big decision on a lot of these is, what's our procurement strategy? You know, how are we going to go after you, your procurement strategy, your acquisition strategy? What's our procurement or our capture strategy? Mm -hmm. Are we going to prime it or are we going to sub it? You know, and then if we do prime it, should we put a team together? Well, we have to talk to our team members and see if team members we want to have on the team, well, maybe they want to prime it. Then we have a, you know, a discussion on who's in the best position to prime and lead this effort. When we prime an opportunity, we also see that as an opportunity to involve smaller disadvantaged businesses. Mm -hmm. And that it gives them an opportunity to develop capabilities and develop the experience. I'm glad Antoine's nodding yes here. Yeah, I am. <laughs> but there's been one thing that we've become much more aggressive with in terms of ensuring that we, we make sure work share now is defined up front on an actual requirement. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is something that large businesses weren't comfortable with at first. But my perspective is we're going to participate in the bid process as hard as we can. But if I don't get work share set up uh, ahead of time, I will not bid because I want to make sure when it's awarded that we participate in the win party and the work share. And so I think it's wonderful, I, you know, going back to our former mentor with HP, that they understand that and they've been really, they've been very good when it comes to developing that. Why, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's a great point. Yeah. We, we've been in a situation where a contract has been won on the back of our credentials and we've seen next to nothing if any work yes. on it. Yeah. And I did have the government in that in one specific case go back to the prime and say, hang on, time out. You were awarded this because of your teammate. Mm -hmm. Where are they? They yeah. were your key personnel. Where are they? I think it's a recommendation. One of the things I know, I think NASA was really good at this, but in looking at the procurement side, I, I would literally evaluate and put real teeth behind the fee mm -hmm. associated with the subcontracting plans. Mm -hmm. um, it's not enough to say you didn't do it. I mean, right. if you associate and evaluate the option and the fee based on your your small business participation, and we need the government to do that. Because mm -hmm. uh, I think the, biz the large businesses that do a good job should be rewarded for that mm -hmm. because they've lived up to the expectations. So, and, and you're saying not just fall back on a good faith effort. Right. No. Okay. And, and that's a fair point, I think, from, from a mid to a large company. And what also I think impacts that, and I've seen this, is when we have RFPs that come out that say only the prime contractor's capabilities will be evaluated. Why did I just put a team together? I've, I've brought Antoine on board because he has a very specific capability mm -hmm. that augments our, our solution and really provides a better solution to the government, why aren't you going to evaluate his capabilities? I don't understand the, the mm -hmm. thought behind that. So, so the suggestion there would be, please, evaluate our entire team, team's capabilities. Yeah. We've assembled the team for a reason. I also like in the GSA schedules arena the use of contractor team arrangements mm -hmm. to yep. be able to bring teams CTAs. together. Mm -hmm. um, they've got a number of uh, uses. Uh, they can help you. In, in our case, we don't have product. Uh, we are the services side of HP, and uh, when we put together a full solution, I will go out and team for that product and bring those um, companies on board. Also, it helps us bring in the niche players mm -hmm. for what we don't have, but it's important for the contracting activity to remember that each of those team members has a prime status. And a lot of times, reading through the RFP, uh, they're referred to it. I'll often have to write questions because they seem to be confused with subcontractors. Um, so understanding that those uh, CTA members are going to bring their own schedule to the party with their own terms, their own labor categories, um, it has some great pluses. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're a business that's not making your 25000 a year on the mm -hmm. GSA schedule, mm -hmm. it's a great way for those companies, instead of subcontracting, if they come in as a contractor team member to gain GSA sales. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so there's some real positives uh, bringing people in there, but um, there needs to be some recognition um, that they are on equal footing, the same thing, maybe their past performance. It's, it gets a little odd if it's products and a solution, mm -hmm. and it's a, you know maybe a, a, a small piece of the product. Um, but maybe for major CTAs to involve their past performance as well. Good point. Let me continue here and shift a little bit from bidding to delivering. Mm -hmm. Checking on our resources to deliver is part of our screening or part of our determination and part of our resource allocation for making that bid. You know, often, uh, Kitty mentioned earlier about key staff and key staff qualifications. We have to make sure we have that key staff and we have to commit to having that key staff available at the anticipated time of award. We have to look at our staffing bench, which I always laugh at. We don't have a staffing bench. There are no benches. There are no benches. No bench. There's no bench. There's no beach. There's no bleacher. There's no right. No. The, the environment is such that we cannot afford to keep people standing on the sidelines waiting for the next project to come in. That's why communication is so key. That's why sticking to schedules and a schedule slip is so key to be communicated back to us. We have found that it has happened that we get an award, and I go back to the government. You know, you are six weeks past your award date. That person is now assigned to another project. Yes, I can transition them off of that project. I need three weeks to do that. You know, I want to give you the best solution, um, but we have to look at the availability of that personnel and be able to plan accordingly. Um, similarly, if there's certain certifications or in a classified environment, if clearances are involved, we have to make sure we have those personnel. And if we don't, we'll make an investment to line those people up. Mm -hmm. In the right situation for our for our company, I mean that that's a company by but company you said type the key of word. It's an investment. It's an mm -hmm. investment. Right, right. Um, are there travel requirements? Something else we look at. Where's the work being performed? I mean, if the work is being performed, you know, uh, somewhere in the D.C. area, we're pretty confident. We'll, you know, we can manage that work very well. If it's being performed at Fort Huachuca, where we don't have a large presence, that's something I'm going to be thinking twice about. Can I operate and can I ensure that the quality of that work is where it needs to be to hit, as Kitty said earlier, the reputation of our company, maintain that reputation, the quality of deliverable. Um, what's our transition plan? You know, it's, it's often a requirement, a large-scale opportunity to have a transition plan. I need to put that plan in place with the appropriate timing to meet your requirements. That means people, that means scheduling, that means planning, that means investing. Uh, and certainly, and this is more Kitty's field than mine, when it's an IT or an infrastructure investment or procurement, there is an investment. I have to make sure that I'm ready to come in and either set up uh, that, that server network or set up that hosting environment to meet the requirement. That's something I've got to determine whether I can do, whether I want to do, and whether I have the money to do. It's interesting. I'll give you an, one investment. We recently started doing business in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, there was a significant investment in licensing insurances that we weren't as a small business aware of, but we really wanted to pursue international work. Um, I think our folks uh, at, at this particular agency, State Department, uh, they understood what we needed, but it was a significant investment just to have the capability and the opportunity to do business mm -hmm. in Afghanistan mm -hmm. and overseas. And so uh, I know for an international organization, uh, such as yours, you guys are used to that, but mid-sized and smalls right. have to recognize mm -hmm. that the opportunities are there, but uh, there are significant investments that need to be made. Well, we even have our own investment challenges, and in that uh, when we invest in something, maybe a data center or an infrastructure, you know, there's a big call now for managed service in the government, mm -hmm. and that calls for a lot of investment on our side to set up that center, set up that data center. Um, and you need to depreciate that expense over time or amortize it. And, you know, our norm might be a three to five year window. Well, the government can terminate for convenience pretty much at any time. So that is one of the risks we have. Um, so we do look for also those opportunities with that period of performance long enough that we can amortize that investment. That's a good point. It's time to move on to win probability. When probability. Okay, so we've we've qualified the deal. Mm -hmm. We've identified and looked at and assessed our resources. So next we get to the win probability. Um, a lot of consideration is given to the probability or likelihood of winning the competition. We know that your win probability is zero if you don't respond to the proposal. Kind of like the old Maryland lottery mm -hmm. a slogan. You got to play to win. So what do you look at, Antoine, um, when you're assessing your win probability? Uh, that's a great question. It's one of our favorite subjects as industry. 
you know, should we bid or not? And you have the perspective. You got to play to win. Um, use a baseball analogy. You're not going to hit a home run if, if you don't swing. Uh, but there's so, so many factors we have to look at. Um, we talked about this earlier. Is there fair competition? Um, at a minimum, that's what we ask for. Uh, all we're saying is level the playing field, give us a fair chance uh, to win this particular opportunity, make sure that we understand the rules and everyone's playing by the same rules. Um, evaluation criteria, make sure it's, it's specific and that we understand it, both on technical and price. Um, it's difficult at times when you hear best value. Uh, because what is best value and I've seen different procurements that really spell it out and I've seen others that say that's up to the discretion of the government that that's a little leery at times because I don't know if I am best value if I lose I think I'm best value <laughs> but how do I know I know we put forth our best effort I, I know we put forth a a fair price and most of the time you know we'll see that it was technically acceptable mm -hmm. what makes uh, Stewart's proposal better than mine from a best value perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. You guys have any thoughts on that one? It's uh, always a nebulous topic. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's, we very rarely see objective criteria defining what best value really means. Right, right. Uh, and where we've seen it particularly is when there's a labor category build up to the price. Well, in my world, the training world, is my instructional designer, my senior instructional designer, have the same qualifications as Kitty's and have the same qualifications as Antoine's. Mm -hmm. And building that cost up, when they don't, we're not doing an apples to apples comparison on the price side. Right. So then how might how do I have confidence that we've got a best value determination or what is that actually based on? Right. Well, so you, you're spot on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, when we look at um, another topic, uh, is, our, is our solution uh, competitive? And, and this is important because I think companies that are serious about doing business with the government are going to make sure that we have some discriminators. We want to make sure that as a government you can say this is why we selected this particular company because they had some unique value proposition. Uh, they had some set of qualities that really going to raise the bar mm -hmm. for, our, for our government partners. And I think that's important, uh, as well as important as best practices. We want to make sure that we're not delivering the services that, that's not proven. Mm -hmm. um, we want to make sure it's, best, it's, it's based on best practices. One of the things that I'm sure all of us talked about was we want to learn from previous engagements. Mm -hmm. and, and our perspective is if we've delivered well, how do we then take something else we've done and deliver for this agency? Mm -hmm once we understand what that agency is. It's not in a vacuum, but I think we want to bring best practices to the table and some way of discriminating uh, such that we understand it's a value proposition that we're adding here. Um, certifications are important in terms of uh, from a competition perspective I and mean, we're looking at um, some way of separating. People have seen it online, they have ISO, um, all of these certifications in the government that stamp you as th that uh, quality is important to you. Um, if you're a CMM level three, four, or five company, it takes a large investment going back previously to getting there. If you're ISO 9000, ISO 27001, um, that means that on top of everything that you're doing, you've invested in that. And I think, can we win this? If we see requirements for those certifications, we understand that the government's perception of quality matches ours. Mm -hmm. And that they're looking at, you know, we want a company that's willing to make that type of right. investment. Right. Anything on that one? I think I hit that. Covered a little hit that one. All right, let's keep going. Let's keep going. I hit the bullseye. Right I hit the bullseye. Um, price, and 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 we'll get later on about this price sensitivity. Um, we understand the environment is getting more competitive. This this word this word that no one knew a few years ago called sequestration uh, is 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 in everyone's home now. Right. You know, and, and we understand that 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 drives prices down. We understand that the government wants the best price that they can. Uh, we just have to be aware of the fact that they've also increased the requirements for individuals. Um, and so there's this transition that has to go on between making sure that we sensitize our staff and our people mm -hmm. on salaries and price while trying to give the government the, the best we can. And I think, I think industry has done a really good job, I think, of trying to be sensitive to price and making sure that we are competitive. Uh, but we just want to make sure that the government understands also if they want sort of the Porsche, mm -hmm. then there's Porsche prices. Right. And they have to sort of be sensitive to the degrees and certifications and clearances that people have. Right. You know, people have invested in those things. You know, those are important. Um, competitive well, I was analysis. I to say along the same lines, yeah. that is tied a lot with requirements. Yeah. To get to that competitive price, to have really well spec requirements. Um, we had a case where we bid the Tesla and from the uh, winning 
uh, awardees price. It was clear the government wanted the Ford Focus. Um, and it was because we did not understand the requirements. They were unclear, and what we thought was wanted was f to the moon and back. And uh, But it turned out they were looking for a much simpler solution, but right. that was not um, clear in the requirements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that helps bring you to a more competitive price. But if, if, we're, if we're asking for a forward focus, that's what we want. Yes, <laughs> make that clear. Yes. Yeah, because, uh, you know, something greater... Right. It's not going to get you there, mm -hmm. you know, because that that can come across as gold plating. I mean, why yeah. pay for something that we don't need? Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you, you, you have to kind of balance it there. But oftentimes, well, if you have a better solution, mm -hmm. you know, if we're saying we want this focus and you say, well, listen, yeah, what I the solution I'm proposing gives you all of that plus and you can use this because X, Y and Z, then, you know, that that's something that would get our attention. Yeah, I think. That's why sometimes we like optional cleanse mm -hmm. uh, because yeah. you have Absolutely. to be compliant. Yes. But if you get a nice optional cleanse, Absolutely. other ideas, um, mm -hmm. that's when we can sort of put that yeah, in. That's there. a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, competitive analysis, and, and we use we coined the term coopetition. Uh, <laughs> so today we're competitors. Tomorrow, tomorrow we're cooperating together. Right. Uh, but we, you know we have to do an analysis. Is there an incumbent we talked about earlier that's doing a really good job? And if they're doing a really good job. And we really feel that it's hard to, 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 to get them out. We may not bid. And, and, and I know the whole purpose is to get more people bidding. But if that incumbent is doing a really good job, you may not see a lot, as many bids that I think the government would like to see. Um, you're also going to look at who may be likely to bid. And you're, you're analyzing your competitors. You're looking at their strengths and weaknesses. You're also looking at how they may attack you. Because we're all in the same room. We all go to industry day together. We all sign a chart, and so as soon as you go in industry day, you look at the piece of paper and says, "Oh, they're bidding again," yeah. and so you're literally going through a little bit of analysis. And so if you look at industry day, there's a lot of war that's going on in that room that no one knows about. You're just looking around and like, "Oh, Stewart's bidding, okay," um, and you 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 aware of his strengths. And so if you're doing what he does, you've now tipped that off, and and, okay. and so it's important that people understand why sometimes in industry day, I think one of you guys mentioned it, was you, that you don't get a lot of questions. Yeah. Be because I may not want to tip the fact right. that I don't know something. Right, um, exactly. But I'm really looking at that is can we win this opportunities? And these are, these are critical factors that lend itself on why you may or may not be receiving as many bids as you would like. Well, let me ask you this. You mentioned about the incumbent. If the incumbent is doing a good job, mm -hmm. it may be kind of difficult to, to break through that. How do you know if the incumbent is doing well? I mean, is this information that you guys share amongst yourselves, or? Well, I'll start off and I'll let him. We saw we talked about this earlier. We we better be in there six months to a yeah. year ahead of time. Uh -huh. Chances are, if I'm in there marketing enough and seeing, I'm hearing great things uh -huh. about the incumbent, and you're seeing, oh, we love them. Yeah. Uh, once I actually saw, I was at a briefing, and the incumbent actually gave the overview about the opportunity. We immediately left because <laughs> we knew that incumbent did an excellent job. Yeah, I'd say that's all about the pre-qualifying the deal there. Yeah. Okay. Knowing, and the last bullet is knowing your customer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Let's do it. That's good. good. Okay. Um, so Antoine, a lot of the discussion has been or, or has a financial overtone. Mm -hmm. Um. In the context of the federal government and our requirements, the risk, uh, at least of, of non-payment, um, is negligible. Can you help us understand what other risks um, you all face in this context? Um, we mentioned something very early in terms of what we have in common. I think one of the things that each company, regardless of the size that you are, you're not going to risk your reputation. Mm -hmm. And that's in terms of delivery, price, performance. Um, everything sort of wraps up in that because if the requirements is undefined, then literally, I know I have before, you have lost money on a deal because at the end of the day, I have to deliver. Mm -hmm. But that deal became highly risky to me, and we made the decision to deliver on a requirement that was undefined because it was fixed price. I don't want to be in the habit of doing that because I'll risk my company, but most companies that I know that have any sense of passion about what they do are not going to risk not delivering mm -hmm. 
on behalf of the government. Um, uh, from a large business yeah. perspective, you guys see the same thing, mid size. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, and so. It's critical to us to assess the risk. That's one of the elements we have as part of our qualifying the deal is to do a risk assessment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think that from from that risk, we're really looking at, and this is important. Um, overall, does this requirement fit our strategy and our capabilities? Um, you may see something or a requirement that looks really good, and, and literally somebody say, "Hey, you should bid this," mm -hmm. but you recognize that stretches you beyond where you should mm -hmm. be. And it increases the risk on performance, getting people that are qualified to do the particular deal. Um, location is important, maybe not as much for a large business, but for a smaller business. My ability to do work um, across the country is ha has to be a proactive uh, endeavor. That means I need to put an office uh, in California, for example, and have somebody there that bleeds what my company bleeds in Enlightened. And so do we have the ability to retain people get people to do the job. Do we understand the culture in location? Because what Washington in this area looks like is far different than California. We had people there once, and my people were so different, I had to go out there and, and, and understand the cultural impact of this. Um, we talked about technical staff here and making sure that you can get people that, uh, regardless of the level, in, in high-end people, people that have this requirement, I may go in and win this opportunity based on people with an education level. Um, or a certain qualification or certain certain skill set, people leave, mm -hmm. and as people leave, do I have the ability to replace that person a year later with somebody that meets that level um, with the price that we, we we talked about? And so these risks are things that we have to look at for performance purposes, um, mitigation plans. You know, there are times when we have to uh, mitigate risk of performance, um, changing requirements. Um, other activities that we have to make sure we have the capacity, the capability, the, the, the subject matter expert to be able to reduce that risk and address an issue if we happen not to perform or if a requirement substantially changes because of other federal activities. Um, anything else on that side? I'm on a roll. No, that's the yeah, honor. I keep going. Um, this one's important, and, and, and any company that's in business, that's a non, even the nonprofits, want to make sure they meet their revenue and profit goals. Um, as we talked about, Two things are important. One, we, we want to deliver, and, 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 and you have to have passion for delivery. But you want to make money doing it. You want to make sure you have the wherewithal to, the profit normally goes back to invest in your company. Right. Um, you're not going to get the certifications. You're not going to get um, the strategies, the marketing, everything you have to do if you don't take that profit to invest uh, in your company. And I think uh, having that risk and being able to understand, uh, will I make money on this particular endeavor? Um, at what point, if it's a multi-year contract, you literally may see the first year or so where you may break even or not make money. And you hope that that option gets renewed because you may invest. And we have, even as a small business, I've invested in a particular opportunity because I wanted that customer. And I knew I went in. But that was a risk on my side that I had to make sure I was prepared, prepared to, uh, to accept. Mm -hmm. Um, and not all your business can be like that, or you wouldn't have I business. would not be in business mm -hmm. at all. And so so now we're going to talk about this bad word uh, that's entered our language, like sequestration, mm -hmm. um, LPTA. And it, it, it's, it's, it's something that I understand it um, from the government perspective. I understand that if you can have something that's technically acceptable, and it is the lowest price, in theory, that's a good deal. Mm -hmm. um, it is just very difficult, and, and I don't, I'm not sure all agencies, but I know if we take the time to put forth a proposal, and in some cases, the way I understand it, that proposal may never get read. Correct. And so imagine spending all the bid and proposal dollars that we, 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 we spent, and imagine what we've done to put that together, and we've done a great, great job, and that proposal has never got read. It will never see the light of day. That I need you to expand on that. Well, if you look at it, and you, you want to talk to this one, yeah, especially, um, I know this is one of your favorite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We've encountered this, yes. not as a company, but um, through uh, the various associations have heard about this, that um, in a an low price, technically acceptable procurement, that there are some contracting activities that look at the prices coming in, and they look at the lowest priced, con uh, lowest price proposal first. And after they review it, if it is technically acceptable, that's it. They're done. Yes. Yep. 
and they do not review any others because they've already identified the low price, technically acceptable proposal. Absolutely. Well, see, when I was a contracting officer, we did the opposite. We looked at the technical oh. side first. Right. And then of those that were top, then we looked at the price. Right. But you're saying now, yes. you're seeing the reverse. Look at the low price, and yep. if it's technically acceptable, you're done. End of the acquisition process. Yep. And right. Uh, and it could be a product of contracting activities that are stressed and yeah. understaffed and looking to find an easier way to do it. Um, the, you know, but LPTA has other aspects going on to it from a risk standpoint that should you be the lucky winner of an LPTA evaluation, um, you really have to pay close attention to the management of the resources mm -hmm. because you are really managing to the lowest common denominator. Mm -hmm. And if the RFP required a bachelor's in five years for the systems administrator, um, you, that's what you want to keep it at. Mm -hmm. And because higher, more experienced talent will cost you more money. And this could be an issue for incumbents, um, because incumbents may have staff that's been on the ground for a long time with that customer. They've developed relationships. And you win as uh, the recompete. And you take those resources away and put on the ground the ones that were actually required as far as the RFP. Um, that then puts a risk at that relationship because your customer says, where's Charlie? I like working with Charlie. I've worked with Charlie for five years. Well, we've moved Charlie on. Mm -hmm. Here's Ned. Ned's really good. And he has what was required. Mm -hmm. So it, it does stress the relationship or requirements that aren't well defined and they go, well, where's that report or that action you used to do for me? Well, it wasn't in the requirements, so we're not going to be performing it. We didn't price it in. Again, that's a stress on a relationship there and um, you know, it goes back to our reputation, our past performance. Um, they're things we strive for. So LPTA brings a number of risks. Yeah, I think in terms of it, there's a place for it on well-defined requirements mm -hmm. that don't necessarily sure. require certain activities or certain experiences, but we, we have to use it as a as a very, as a tool and not just, you know, I got this hammer every time. Right. So I think that's going to be very, very important. Um, contractual risks are, are important. Terms and conditions, um, we've made lawyers uh, extremely uh, rich based on the increased number of terms and conditions in the RFPs at this point, where uh, years ago I was able to read it myself. I've given up and I'm, my lawyer is very happy uh, about what, what he's doing at this point because I got to make sure that term and condition um, is compliant with the FAR. Uh, also, if I'm priming it, it's flow downs mm -hmm. to my subs. Sure. Uh, and, 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 and if there's a large business that's under me, they're like, wait a minute, I don't know if I don't want to accept these flow downs or not. Uh, very similar, if I'm subbing, mm -hmm. there's flow downs that come that make sense for an HP. But they don't make sense for me. I'm not sure if they make sense all the time, so for uh, you. It depends what it is. Yeah. But yeah. we also have the RFPs that say you are required to flow down all of the clauses yes. to your subcontractors. So then that becomes a negotiation. If my subcontractor doesn't want to accept it, and the government comes back and wants to evaluate my teaming agreement, it doesn't see it in there, I've got an invalid teaming agreement. Yeah. So there's, it's, it's a set of complexities, and the our lawyers are happy too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the things, that, next topic under this is a risk, is OCIs. And this is something that's very interesting. And I know government sometimes is saying, why aren't you bidding? Mm -hmm. And there's a risk of, if I win this work, I will be OCI'd from doing the implementation work, which, you know, makes sense. But the smaller, con the contract that you may go after is small smaller, and you want the implementation work. Mm -hmm. And literally, uh, we started to shy away. We have a management consulting practice, but we started to shy away from certain work because if I did the upfront analysis or uh, we used to help government select their COTS products mm -hmm. and we did all this work and, and, and all of a sudden the big guys or another company would come in and they'd be there for five years. Mm -hmm. I was there for nine months okay. and I'm looking at the fruit of my labor being implemented for millions of dollars and I'm happy for my seven dollars that I got. And so the OCI clauses, um, although very good and we're not complaining about it, but just recognize that that will um, cause certain people not to bid because they want the larger opportunity the implementation work. But yeah, and, and that's fair. It's just being aware of the fact that, uh, and, and I think the government's been uh, much more upfront with understanding that if you do this, the follow-on work you won't be able to do, mm -hmm. and, and that's been important. Right. 
So, and but then for you, you have to make a business decision yes. if you're gonna go for the upfront more, mm -hmm. forego it, and wait for the back end. Or, and we've made strategic decisions that at this particular agency, we're going to do this type of work with OCI and us from implementation. And okay. that's been a conscious decision because maybe we want to be perceived as trusted advisors. Okay. And that's the role that we're playing okay. for that particular agency, mm -hmm. but that was a proactive decision. Okay. Is it? Can we move on? Yep, we can move on. Okay. Stuart, communicating with the federal government and us communicating with you. Um, procurement officials have to be careful about the information that they release to vendors or, or well, I'm going to say our partners, okay? Um, the element of fairness always has to be in the forefront. So you don't want to disclose any information to one source that's going to give them an unfair com a competitive edge over another. Um, and that's not to say that we should not communicate and we should not do it early because we should. And not only is it, good, is it a good business practice, but Mythbusters, our myth busting campaign mm -hmm. tells us we should do that. It's a good thing. So my question to you, um, and, and not only should we, we do that often, but especially in the area of high risk or complex procurements, how do we balance that? How do we balance the element of fairness, not giving away too much information, with getting industry involved early on? I think the key there, and most communication is good communication, and most communication with the federal government, contrary to the comment behind me, is good communication. <laughs> <laughs> we realize that. Um, what we recommend, thank you, what we recommend is do the early and often communication. By doing that, by saying that you'll do that, you provide an equal opportunity for everybody to communicate with you. Now, I realize on the other side of that, especially in large complex procurements, is that's a very significant time commitment from the federal government. Mm -hmm. If you're going to have meetings with all the potentially interested vendors, it, it is. So industry days do come, they do have a place. Exactly. Um, you know, we see that they're not happening often enough, either industry days or one-on-ones. Um, they really do help us, and in the long term, even though there is that time commitment, it makes your job easier. If you get a proposal that's more structured and more specifically oriented to provide the solution that you really need and are really asking for, mm -hmm. your evaluation becomes easier. Right. So we think right. there, is, there is a win-win there. Um, but we've, we've touched on this a couple of times. Realize in open forums there is a reluctance of us to ask certain questions, either to tip our hand on our excellence or our ignorance. <laughs> so we're, you know, we are careful about that. Right. Um, so now, now, what do you think about using social media tools? I mean, do you see that as being more helpful or... I think there's absolutely a place for it. Okay. And Kitty mentioned Interact earlier. Uh, we find that the, the new age cap procurement, that's a joint venture between OPM and GSA, mm -hmm. they're using Interact. It's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Using the portal, right. getting information out there, announcing industry days ahead mm -hmm. of time. Mm -hmm. uh, they've gone as far as meeting with uh, the Coalition for Government Procurement, setting up mm -hmm. an industry day. Mm -hmm. It was a very valuable experience where I think there's a very positive information exchange. Mm -hmm. and it was a place where we could express some concern you know, fixed price contract, why are you asking for labor category rates? Should you be asking for what's the cost to actually develop product X? Um, we had a discussion on innovation. You know, I love being asked for innovation, but federal government, how are you measuring innovation? Mm -hmm. What are your objective criteria for determining if my solution is innovative? Oh, and it may be really innovative. It's going to work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, be, that, that was a very good, you know, a good, good example of where the communication is taking place and, and I think had a very positive impact, very positive result for both organizations. Mm -hmm the procuring organization as well as the potential partners. Partners, not vendors, partners. Partners, um, absolutely. <laughs> something else that we think is helpful is when an RFI is released, give us as much information as you can. Try not to stick to just the PWS or the statement of work or statement of objectives. Go ahead and give us the terms and conditions. Mm -hmm. um, give us L and M. Yeah. That gives us a great opportunity to come back to you and say, hey, no questions, you know that looks great. Or, hey, can you revise or revisit L&M because we don't feel like the, pre the preparation instructions and the evaluation criteria match? Or what I see more commonly, the preparation instructions don't match the statement of objectives. Okay. So then I'm left guessing how I really should be putting my proposal together. Okay. The clearer you are and the information you provide to us, the clearer response we can give back to you. And again, that much easier to evaluate. Um, it's a win-win. Um, 
and certainly keeping us up to date even after we submit a proposal yeah. helps us. Yeah, that, if, that was talked touched on earlier. Right. Yeah. And we will make an investment. We will try to keep those staff available if we think we're still in the game mm -hmm. and we know that the award date is two weeks out. Mm -hmm. Two weeks, I can usually find a way to manage people and keep people together mm -hmm. and keep that key personnel available. But some indefinite time period, it gets harder and harder and yeah. harder. And right. we, talked, we talked about this where I think right now I have a procurement that's about two years. We submitted two years ago. Uh, we have no idea when it's going to be awarded. And I've had people that have left the company that were key in that. And so we called and say, where, where are we? They said, we're evaluating it. And so what do I do in that case? And so I think, to Stuart's point, that's where communication is important so we can anticipate the award date. Yeah. Do this one. Thank you. Um, yes. Well, what we find that also helps us is that evaluation criteria we were talking about. And it just go, it goes beyond just L and M. It does go into uh, pricing. It goes into time frame. It goes into delivery requirement. It really is a full set of criteria. Um, again, it makes it easier for us and easier for you. Um, but the big thing for the communication pitfall slide here is even pre-award, talk to us. If there's a question about our proposal, don't disappear and make an assumption which we'll give you plenty of in our proposal, of course. But right. don't come back and make an assumption about what we mean. Come back and ask us. We're happy to come down and clarify information with you. And we think that certainly is something that's proper to do because we're not changing our proposal. We're explaining our proposal. Mm -hmm. We're explaining you know, this assumption you may interpret to mean X when it really was interpreted or intended to mean Y. Mm -hmm. And we can clarify it for you. And give, give us that opportunity. Just want to say it's heartbreaking to find that out in a debrief. Yes. Mm -hmm. Something oh, that yeah. could have been clarified on a question. and. Um, we've encountered a contracting activity that thought that under GSA schedule procurements, if they asked a question, it meant they were in a discussion. And if they had a discussion under GSA schedule procurement, it automatically threw it into FAR Part 15. Now, no, it doesn't. Um, we couldn't explain that at that time to the contracting officer. But so having, it's okay to have discussions under GSA schedule procurements that mm -hmm. will not put you into a FAR Part 15, right. they're two completely separate parts of the FAR. Um, so that was heartbreaking, something that could have just been an, a clarification question did not occur. Um, so yes, please open up, have discussions. Right. And, and we're not saying it doesn't happen, it does happen. We would just like to see it happen more frequently, that's mm -hmm. all. Right. So, go ahead. Um, I, Mention the word assumptions. Is it a good word or a bad word? Um, you know, I will tell you, if it's a fixed price procurement, you're going to get assumptions. Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, we're assuming the risk, we have to protect ourselves and the yes. risk. Um, but let us know, you know, if you really want them or don't want them, or give us guidance. We like guidance. Guidance makes our job easier. Um, and then Kitty just mentioned learning something in a debrief. Mm -hmm. Debriefs are invaluable tools for us, whether we win or we lose. We want to know what we did well. Mm -hmm. We want to know what our areas for improvement are. Uh, we want to know. I mean, basically, it's, it's our turn to get educated. It's our turn to get some feedback on what we can do so we can do it better next time. It's very important for us. Right. So your know, suggestion there, obviously, is make them substantial. Mm -hmm. And uh, too often, we're hearing on GSA schedule procurements that uh, debriefs do not occur with GSA schedules. Although the FAR 8.4 does say that upon request, an explanation. And so we have seen the full gamut of you lost, that's your explanation, to something that looked very much like a terrific debrief that told us what happened. Um, there is nothing more heartbreaking than winning a, losing a $45 million deal and hearing, no, no debrief, it's GSA schedule. That just doesn't help anyone. Um, yeah. And we're often asked for debriefs when we win. Mm -hmm. Because we want to know what we did right for the next proposal. Absolutely. So, the, and you know, just understand, mistakes happen. Mm -hmm. um, we may make a mistake in the proposal. We want to hear what, and in rare cases, the contracting activity makes a mistake. Maybe in the evaluation or how they handled the procurement, mm -hmm. and this is the opportunity for those things to be discovered and fixed. Um, I have. Oh, not every debrief results in a protest. Mm -hmm. um, 
Even when you find something in a debrief that is grounds for a protest, the company may elect not to protest. We still believe that um, some contracting activities may not like you after you protest and it can uh, impede future awards. So <laughs> there is sometimes a reticence to protest right. because you don't want to damage a relationship or a future relationship. Right. Um, so uh, more often than not, we hear that protests occur because the debrief was incomplete and you walk out saying, what are they hiding? Yeah. What didn't they tell us? Yeah. And for some companies, that may be the click to protest, right, exactly. to get that additional information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I like a good, I like a good debrief. Mm -hmm. You learn stuff. Yeah, I think you get a better partner, an industry yeah. partner, because I, I know when we had a debrief, we lost an opportunity, and when we got the debriefing, we realized our customer intimacy was off, and we had to do more homework with that particular customer because we thought we had the right solution. But we just didn't have the intimacy that we needed, and we needed to do more homework. Mm -hmm. And I think that was important. We subsequently won a later deal because it let us know we needed to do a better job of learning that customer. Right. For us, it, it sparked a whole new process. Uh, maybe 15 years ago, we lost a deal, and it turned out that on the past performance, um, customers had not responded with past performance questionnaires. We were rated neutral, but that affected our rating compared to the winner. Mm -hmm. And uh, we made a conscious effort afterwards to change our internal process and making sure that the delivery managers went back and followed up with customers when we requested a past performance to make sure it was executed. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of good that comes out of them. I'm just wondering if some contracting officers just see this as, as the debriefing as a hotbed to get information to support a protest, and they kind of steer away from it. No one ever likes to lose. <laughs> so you, and, but you do want to find out what went wrong. Yeah. Why? I mean, why? Yeah, and we, unfortunately, we find that there are times where we just don't get a debrief. We okay. request a debrief. And that falls on deaf ears. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'll, I'll use that to kind of transition again to the, the after submission types of pitfalls. We want that communication even after we submit, mm -hmm. whether it's awarded with the debrief or mm -hmm. whether it's not yet awarded. Give us an idea of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And there's really, I mean, I'll, I'll be passionate about one point here. I, sometimes I think it's lost on some of the contracting officers and some of the federal government offices that things that are delayed without communication put people's jobs at jeopardy. Uh, we have had to reduce our workforce because of an unknown. Turns around, we get that work, now we've reduced our workforce, but it's also impacted our ability to meet the mission objectives of our client. Um, this economy today, you know, the world we're dealing with today, it's more sensitive now than probably ever. Mm -hmm. And nobody likes to have that conversation with a person saying, oh, Antoine, I'm sorry, tomorrow's gonna be your last day because that bid didn't come through. Mm -hmm. And believe me, it's worse in his seat. Yeah. I mean, both because he's a person I just let go, but also as a small business owner, mm -hmm. it, it's a tougher situation there. It's, it, that window is a shorter time frame, and yeah. he's able to keep staff on board. Yeah, it really is. And it is hard. We, last year, we, uh, many of us in industry were commenting on that the pending awards, there were more than usual, and they were taking longer, a, a year later, to find out if you won. Others, you keep pinging the contracting office, any news, no, we'll let you know, no, we'll let you know, and then you eventually find out they lost the funding. Yeah. And it, ju it just went away, right. but nobody told you, and it's still on mm -hmm. um, somebody's radar. Um, as a program manager, we have goals that we're graded on, our performances, and, you know, if you have pending deals, that's part of it. So you need to understand if that's going to go away, you have to go find more work to make up for your shortfall. So it helps you plan better as a manager. Right. Right. Absolutely. If we're kept in the dark, we can't plan. We can't be strategic. We can't even be tactical. Right. Um, you know, it, I, we understand that it's a big workload for the contracting officers, the procurement organizations, to respond to inquiries. We, we understand that. If you're getting that many inquiries, the suggestion there, I think, is release a FedBizOps update. Here's the update on the procurement. That way everybody has access to it. Or right. put something on GSA Interact. Right. Perfect. Absolutely. That, that's, that's Let us know it's that. still alive. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if it's something that 
in some cases, you may have an inkling that you are in the still in the competitive range, so you might actually be doing some minor investment preparing for mm -hmm. it in the event you win because there might be a short transition period or a quick ramp up is needed. So you might be doing something. You could be hiring that niche personnel or at least putting out a contingency offer. And you need to know when to kind of have that sense of when to do it. So it's all very important to keep in the loop there because upon award, your customer does want it delivered. They, they want right. it up and running. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, of late, we have come to be very familiar and, and expect CRs. I mean, yeah. like you said, that's just a way of life yes. anymore. So, I mean, and with those, it brings a, 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 a certainly a high level of uncertainty. So I'm waiting on FY14 awards. <laughs> <laughs> a few more on the hopper. Yes. Yes. So, and I guess, are we... Getting it's, to it. It's, are, are you? Yeah, we're good. Stuart, thank you. Thank you. That was very informative. I just want to thank you all um, for this wonderful discussion and for bringing your incredible insight to us. Um, but before we wrap up, Kitty, can you um, give us a little bit of context around how we can improve industry relationships? Um, leave us with some takeaways. Okay. Um, so Stuart, Antoine, and I discussed it, and mm -hmm. we have uh, six that we think, uh, not that it will completely right the world, <laughs> but um, certainly will go a long way um, to working on those communications. Um, I guess one is just uh, to understand that bid and proposal funds are limited. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is a finite amount. We have to pick and choose what we work on. Um, and there are things that eat up that money faster than others. So that when we are working on a proposal, that writer is being paid. So we need to get that done. Um, we bid what we believe we can win. So um, I know that uh, it was recently, I think about a year ago, enacted in the civilian side. It's been around in DOD for a long time. The need to have three bids. Um, I got to tell you, we, we do dread the calls where yeah. They say, hey, can you put in a bid? I, I, you know, aren't you going to bid? And you realize they, prop, they need three bids, and yeah. your chance of winning is pretty low. Um, we really only want to bid on what we believe we can yeah. win. Sure. Um, and we bid on what we know we can deliver. Mm -hmm. That's important to us because past performance is key. There's a new thing, you know, you'll be hearing more about reputation management, um, understanding how we look to the government customers, mm -hmm. CPAR is more available. Mm -hmm. So um, we want to look good. So we only bid on what we can deliver. Uh, communication improves the proposed solution. We've beaten that one. It's, talk to us. <laughs> Tell us what you need. Tell us what you want. Tell us what you really, really want. <laughs> yeah. um, clearly define the requirements and the evaluation criteria. Make sure they match up. Um, and the more you can define requirements, and I know that it's difficult um, in these skinny days. Um, you don't, uh, program shops don't always have the personnel to fully develop those requirements, mm -hmm. but they are becoming key, especially as we've moved to fixed price. Um, and uh, set realistic timelines and expectations. Understand um, quality takes time. Just tossing something over is not going to be what you really want. Right. Exactly, or that's, I mean, you know, garbage in, garbage, garbage out. out. Uh -huh. Yeah, so. so. But uh, I think anything else, gentlemen? Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Really Thank, appreciate you. It. Thank you. Thank um, you. This has been wonderful, fantastic, guys. I, I certainly want to deeply express my thanks, and you guys taking the time out of your busy schedule. I enjoyed the discussion, and mm -hmm. I'm sure our audience will as well. Hold on and stay tuned. We're going to take a short five minute break and we'll be right back with your questions and our answers. Thank you for joining us for this Q&A. We're going to use the last minutes of our session to address some of the questions submitted by you. First question. The panelists indicated vendors are more likely to bid if they know well in advance that an RFP is coming out. How much are we allowed to tell a vendor about an RFP before it is released? Well, okay, Mythbusters, the entire campaign is designed to 
engage early with industry, to get industry, bring them into the picture, and uh, engage ideas um, from industry. But as procurement professionals, we also have to balance uh, procurement integrity. So when you talk to a vendor, um, just keep in mind uh, the element of fairness and ask yourself, is the information you're given going to give that vendor a competitive advantage over someone else? If the answer is yes, then you probably should not release that information. But um, again, if a vendor comes in and they might want a clarification on something that they've seen in our forecast, um, you certainly can clarify the information because the, the forecast just really gives very scant information. So again, you can, you can clarify the information in there. Keep in mind, you know, again, the element of fairness. Don't give away any information that would give a competitive advantage to one vendor. Um, and again, um, we, we've, we've got to engage industry early on. So keep in mind you have to balance the two. I can't tell you specifically what you can and cannot release, but as a contracting officer, you, you've got to use your own best judgment. And the second part of the question was, how does industry find out about a potential RFP 180 days out when most procurement shops try not to communicate one-on-one -on -one with vendors to prevent favoritism? Well, besides the procurement shops, our teams are out speaking with the program managers. We could have work at that agency, and so we're interacting on a daily basis. And we are trying to find out more about the customer's mission, their objectives, some of the needs they have. And we're talking with the program management staff, educating them possibly about our capabilities. We're also attending conferences and expos, and there's ongoing interaction. In addition, some agencies like agent GSA on the current Alliance 2 have been working on Interact on the social media to put out information about their upcoming procurement. They've asked us questions about how we see some of the cybersecurity rules and we've been providing input there. So there is dialogue going on before the procurement comes out, but it's not what I would call sensitive in nature. It's, it's, you're absolutely right, Kitty. Thank you for that. And that's another tool I would encourage contracting officers to use. The blogs, um, you guys at GSA, we have Interact. And that, that's a terrific way to engage industry early on. And again, you, you have the, the fairness out there because everybody can access that site and see the information that you're providing. So that, that's an excellent tool. Next question. RFIs are a market research tool. With respect to RFIs, you appear to be skeptical of those which sought engineering input. I find that many of our RFIs are attempts to narrow the technical scope to ones which are relevant and biddable. How can we best bridge the gap between requirements developed exclusively by agencies through their internal expertise and market research other than RFI. And the RFIs that engage the vendor community to help define the approach. Anton, Twan, can you answer that please? Yeah, I'll start off with that one. Um, I think as you, look at, as you look at an RFI, you're looking at the opportunity of can you qualify enough organizations that can do the work? So you put the information in such that you get a feel for are there small businesses that can actually do the work? But you also have to balance that between are there, are we providing so much information that that RFI becomes an RFP, an RFP from the perspective of how much solutioning we're putting in place, an RFP from a perspective of how much money we're taking to do the bid. And so if you're looking for a balance, um, you should seek enough information to know that you have qualified companies in an RFI, but not so much that you're ac actually asking for the solution, uh, the total solution, and you're asking for a full proposal. Kitty, anything you want to add to that? I, uh, RFIs, we do want to give engineering advice. Yes. I mean, uh, if for us it's a balance because when we're working on the RFI, that takes benches of writers and solution architects, and depending on how much information is required, that's taking resources away from a proposal that could be being written. So we want to give information on RFIs, but 
probably not at the depth we would on a proposal. Exactly, exactly. And so as we look at the balance, and, and I really appreciate that question, it's enough balance, I think, for our government counterparts, our partners in government, to know and be comfortable that the companies that we're dealing with, you actually have and we have the ability, but not so much that we're actually given the proposal itself. Okay. I see. So question three is, how might the to bid or not to bid decision be affected by the size of a company? For example, small business company's decision of whether or not to bid. Um, as we look at, yeah, as we look at to bid on an opportunity uh, as a small business, one of the things that we have is, do we have the capacity, the financial wherewithal, the ability to at least do 51% of the work? Um, as I mentioned before, HP is a mentor and we've been a mentor in, 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 in the relationship and so we look at can a small business do at least 51 percent of the work uh, do we have the ability the capacity the wherewithal the financial wherewithal to ensure that um, we can float what well, we have to float in, in financially uh, but that's our measuring stick if we can do 51 percent of the work we're going to bid the opportunity if it passes our gates if we believe we have the ability the capacity and if we have the ability to uh, do the work yeah, and we look at the same considerations, even as a not small business. You know, our decision goes back to some of the things we discussed in the presentation. Is this a core capability of our company? Is this something that is a strength that we can respond to with the right solution at a cost competitive uh, proposal or price basis? So that that's really how we're looking at these things. That impacts our business. Uh, the size factor there is, you know, even as a mid-sized or a large business, we still have revenue uh, revenue targets we have to hit. Right. So can this contribute positively to our revenue and cash flow? Right. So the decision points are very, very similar. Mm -hmm. Question four. I am a federal employee and haven't gotten a raise in three years. So I am offended by routine annual price increases for contractors of approximately 3% that are quoted in many of the price quotes that I review. Given the current budget climate where government salaries are constrained, can you justify the routine annual increases given to contractors? I'm going to hand that over to Kitty. Oh, thank you so much. Um, when we look at escalation on a contract, it's not directly, while labor rates do factor in there, there's other factors in our labor categories. We have space. Um, health insurance benefits that are out there and a lot of those energy costs have increased so they're also contributing to the escalation um, when we do have escalation say in, when it's GSA schedule related that GSA uh, contracting officer generally relates our escalation to some documented proof of the escalation. Uh, frequently they use the Bureau of Labor Statistics, economic price adjustments in there and some of the tables to document where that adjustment should come from. So again escalation while related to some labor rates itself, people's salaries, is also related to other things. What else is going on is a labor rate is not exactly attached to a particular person but a pool of people. And that pool of people is constantly shifting as companies have turnover. We need to attract new talent as they leave. Some of them go to government jobs, some to other companies, and we need to refresh that. And in general, the person you hire in costs more than the person you're replacing. Okay. So they're all the factors we look at with right. escalation. Okay, so it's just not one single factor. Correct. Yeah, I, thank you. And I, I love this question because it's a very sensitive issue. Um, we have the staff retention issue. We have an environment, as the questioner points out very accurately, that is a challenging environment. It's challenging for contractors to keep our staff game, gainfully employed. We don't have the stability that we've had in the past. We have a particular contract at an agency where the agency, and five of my staff members have gone to work for the agency because of the stability the agency employment environment could provide for our staff members. So there are trade-offs. There are trade-offs. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Next question. 
In regards to solicitations and RFPs coming out around the holidays, would you rather see the RFP come out before the holidays and then have a longer time to respond or delay release of the RFP until after the holidays and have a shorter time to respond? Stuart, what do you think about that? Uh, thanks. I had a feeling something about this might come up when I made my comment about holidays. Um, can I go off the board and answer a question that's not one of the choices here, please? Um, we've actually, we, we like the necessary time to respond to a proposal. If we don't have the time to respond, it's going to decrease the quality of response that you get and make it harder for you to evaluate. We actually, you know, we'd like for you guys to consider our schedules as well as your schedules. And we need to have generally, well, we need to have a set amount of time depending on the complexity of, of the proposal to respond. Unfortunately, what we see with the holiday issue is it's often here it's issued beginning of December and you're turning it in beginning of January. Um, could we add, you know, if it's going to be over the holidays, add a few weeks on the back end, allow us to adjust, you know, those who are working through the holidays, and some folks do. But again, as I mentioned earlier, we are. Our company, at least, is a use or lose company on holidays uh, due to Sarbanes-Oxley. You know, we don't want the liability of leave being held against our books. Um, give us a little bit more on the back end, maybe, uh, you know, if, if it needs to be released over the holiday time period. We'll get it done, but the more time we have and the less we have to you know, infringe on folks' holiday time, the better, the better response you're going to get, quite frankly. Okay. All right. Thanks. Next question. I regularly get proposals that avoid addressing the criteria or are ambiguous or are otherwise deficient in addressing the criteria or are top heavy with some meaningless marketing lingo. What is the problem with contractors being able to clearly address evaluation criteria or better yet not offering proposals if they cannot articulate their solutions? according to the evaluation criteria. Well, you know, if your evaluation criteria is clear and unambiguous, and you get a proposal that does not address the uh, criteria or fails to meet it, I believe that's called non-responsiveness. And you should act accordingly. Um, we typically take those proposals and set them aside. Um, but again, they're, they're not considered anymore. So it's non-responsive. Next question. What is your criteria for initiating a protest? In order to avoid protests, I go out of my way to use contract vehicles like NASA SUIT or NITAAC or Army CHESS ITES S, where protests are rare or restricted. What is your feeling about vendors that aggressively initiate protests which have no real merit but are nothing more than very expensive nuances and are strategic to avoid an award to a competitor? Kitty. Oh. <laughs> protests are difficult. We don't take them lightly. Um, I can tell you that there have been opportunities where we felt a need to protest and we didn't. Um, we weigh, you know, the impact it will have on our customer relationship. And uh, generally, a good contractor is going to protest when they honestly believe that there is a reason to protest. Now, we do know some protest because debriefs have been short of information, and that might be the only way a company figures out what happened. So, but, if, but if there's no merit, find a way to penalize them, quite honestly, because it's wasting everybody's time. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Okay, all right. Well, that brings us to the close, of the close of this segment and session. I want to thank my guests again, uh, Kitty Klaus, Antoine Ford, and Stuart Gatilman for their insight and perspective. The slide presentation, along with answers to some of the questions received will be posted to FAI's website in the coming weeks. I'm Melissa Gary. Again, thank you for joining us this afternoon, and have a great week. That was a rather eye-opening journey on what government procurements are like from an industry perspective. We certainly hope you found today's seminar beneficial 
as we're sure it gives us all greater appreciation for what industry must do to bring tools, products, and services to the marketplace, and specifically the government marketplace. Don't forget, the Federal Acquisition Institute has recorded today's seminar, and the video, along with the presentation material you saw today, will be posted in the video library on FAI.gov. You should be able to access these items in a week or so. On behalf of the Federal Acquisition Institute, thank you once again for joining us.